Hello, hello. I'm Federico Caruso from OBC Trans Europa, and today we're here to talk about the so-called datafied society and its implications for uh, European democracies. So, with this label, we mean a lot of different issues, both that affect both the private and public sphere. Uh, for the public, uh, for the, the private sphere, we we can talk for issue for instance about a big tech lobbying and big tech monopolies um, in the european environment so uh, because as we know there are some companies that uh, rely on uh, huge throws of data for uh, uh, to flourish let's say and also in the public sector for instance uh, um, big data are uh, becoming more and more important for the migration policies uh, in, in Europe uh, for border control and also for uh, the risk assessment for uh, terrorist attacks uh, and so on. And also there is this uh, discussion going on about uh, on the regulation for the for artificial intelligence. So a lot of different issues uh, that affect both data protection, privacy, automated decision making. And um, so we'll talk about uh, some of these issues with, uh, uh, from the point of view of uh, two journalists and researchers that are covering uh, these topics uh, since a while now. So uh, welcome to Andreas uh, Wu and uh, Nicolas Kaiserbrill. Can you hear me? Yeah. <laughs> Hello. So. Uh, to start, I'll, I'd ask you to briefly introduce yourself. Uh, so, Andreas, please. Great. And uh, Nicolas, please. So my name is Nicolas Kaiserbrill. I'm a journalist for Algorithm Watch, uh, which is a Berlin-based nonprofit that um, sheds light on uh, automated decision-making systems. Uh, and I report on uh, systems that can be um, automated um, um, welfare benefits, for instance, um, automated fraud detection, uh, but also how um, uh, big tech uses automated systems that can have an impact on society, such as how um, companies like Facebook uh, decide what to show their users. Okay, great. Uh, yeah. Uh... Let's start for, from the, the last thing you were saying, uh, uh, Nicolas, because you, um, you made for the European Data Journalism Network an investigation on the Instagram algorithm. So, uh, yeah, C can you uh, shortly tell us what, what were the, the main findings uh, and uh, what do you see as their implication on a broader sense on this kind of uh, uh, of um, mechanisms that are going on with this uh, with this um, social networking uh, and algorithmic uh, platforms? Let's say. So the, the investigation we conducted um, for uh, EDJNet um, was on uh, Instagram's newsfeed algorithm. 
Uh, it started uh, when uh, a professional content creator, so uh, someone who um, uses Instagram as uh, a way to reach an audience um, professionally, uh, told us that uh, she had the feeling that she could only reach her audience when she was posting pictures of herself in a bikini. Um, and so based on this first uh, lead, we um, conducted lots of uh, interviews with uh, content creators who um, almost all confirmed um, this uh, impression. Uh, we uh, analyzed um, many documents that uh, Facebook and Facebook engineers uh, had been um, um, publishing, such as uh, patents. Uh, and finally, we conducted an experiment with uh, data donors where they would uh, install a browser plugin, which would give us access to their own uh, Instagram newsfeed so that we could uh, see what they were um, given uh, by Instagram to, to see. Uh, and the, the result of this um, investigation was that uh, it seemed clear that um, Instagram was uh, indeed pushing uh, pictures of uh, men and women uh, barely clothed um, so that yeah it, it was true that as a content creator you had um, you were much more likely to reach your audience if you were posting pictures of yourself in a bikini um, and these results uh, at least from the, the data uh, based part of, of the results uh, were confirmed uh, in another experiment um, later uh, which used uh, a much more uh, refined uh, data analysis. Um, and this is interesting for several reasons. Uh, the first one is that it shows that um, Instagram users have, um, have to follow uh, the unwritten, um, um, the, the, the unwritten, sorry, I'm uh, looking for the, the right word, um, have to follow what Instagram wants them to do. Uh, and this is written nowhere because on the if you read the Instagram guidelines, uh, it's written that nudity is uh, disallowed. So indeed, if you post pictures of yourselves that are too naked, you're going to be banned, sometimes automatically banned. Uh, but if you post pictures of yourself with uh, too many clothes, then you're not going to reach your audience at all. Um, so professional content creators have to navigate this very fine line between what uh, Facebook wants from them and when, what Facebook doesn't want from them. Uh, but there are no written rules. So they have to guess the rules, which uh, leads to trying to obey in advance to what they think that uh, Facebook wants from them. So it's, it's a very um, problematic um, situation. Um, and the, the other thing that's interesting in the, in the research we, we did is um, how little we could gain uh, from a um, technological uh, point of view, uh, because, of course, we were able to see what our data donors uh, saw, um, but we don't know if this is representative of um, all Instagram users. Uh, we don't know, because we are working in the, um, in the web browser, we don't know if what they saw in the web browser was the, the same thing that... Um, they saw in the uh, Instagram app on their mobile. Um, and e even though we invested a lot of money and a lot of time, uh, and we had very good professionals uh, working with us, professional programmers, professional statisticians, um, at the end of the day, our results are still, um, they, they could be more uh, solid. Uh, and it shows that it's uh, probably impossible for regulators and for journalists to understand what's going on in the black boxes of Facebook and um, and others. Uh, and it shows that um, regulators yeah, um, have no choice. But I mean, this is very interesting because as you wrote uh, a lot of uh, they European able to uh, gain users uh, are uh, in Instagram, uh, but there's no way to uh, to see what happens under the hood, let's say. Uh, so it's uh, it's it's a hard topic also for for policymakers who i mean um, who depict uh, europe as uh, the leading um, space for uh, for instance for data protection and for the this idea of creating a digital single market for the european union but actually uh, this uh, 
these companies that don't clearly rely on a, a physical space uh, are very hard to, to regulate. So this uh, brings me to the question of the tech lobbying strategies that uh, companies like Facebook and uh, but also Amazon and uh, Google uh, are, are trying to push forward in, in Europe. So could you, uh, could you tell us, um, Andreas, what's happening in, uh, in, this, in this area lately? Yeah, and, and to talk about journalism and uh, uh, business models of journalism also uh, comes to mind what is happening uh, with uh, Facebook and Google News and the sharing of, uh, of news 
on those on these platforms i mean there is this uh imbalance between uh, states that uh as we saw in in australia but uh maybe it's going to happen also in uh, europe where uh, there is this uh friction between states that want to regulate the uh copyright uh for the for the sharing of um of uh, news on these platforms but the but on the other side the the business model of many uh, media outlets relies on the traffic that comes from those platforms so uh, the it seems that uh, like google and facebook mostly are trying to make uh, agreements with uh, with the, um, media outlets to so that both parts are happy let's say but of course uh this uh, uh, this brings states not to regulate too strictly this uh, this field so i mean there is a, a big tension here between uh, uh between uh, the, the freedom of uh, uh sharing content on the internet and uh, and what the interests of the, of the platforms are. So, yeah, and uh, to talk about, uh, in general, these topics, uh, sometimes I feel like um, uh, to talk about how to uh, report on these topic, topics uh, in a way that is uh, um, interesting and attractive attractive also for uh, non-experts because you know wh when we talk about uh, lobbying and also I don't know behavioral advertising uh, and uh, stuff like that uh, sometimes uh, I m my fear is that um, yeah non-experts uh, could be not totally aware of uh, of the of the threats that are under these uh, these words, so I think it's very interesting the work uh, you are doing uh, at Algorithm Watch to spot these uh, automated decision making uh, systems that are in force uh, in Europe in different countries, and uh, because I mean they bring to reality what these. Um, uh all these uh, all these threats could uh, could um, could be so uh nicolas could you please uh, like uh tell us uh, maybe some examples that you spotted uh over the course of the research and also um i mean the the general uh, impact and reception that you had with the two reports that you that you released. And we, we uh, cover um, a lot of um, areas uh, because automated systems um, are found in many different places. Uh, it can be uh, how uh, Google Maps is um, encouraging uh, drivers to use um, uh, one street and not another. This can lead also to problems because sometimes Google Map is going to encourage drivers to, um, um, to use streets uh, illegally, such as uh, streets that are reserved for cyclists, for instance. Uh, in some other cases, uh, we look at how uh, an employment agency uh, is uh, downgrading uh, women um, uh, and um, uh, gi giving them less chances to um, be trained uh, to to, uh, to access to a, a training program because the uh, the system considers that uh, women are less successful in the employment market. Um, so it, it, it ranges from, um, um, so sorry, we, we look at many different um, areas. Um, regarding the, uh, the reception of um, our stories, um, 
I'd say the, the Instagram story that I mentioned earlier was um, widely shared and widely read uh, because it addressed uh, an issue that many people uh, were aware of. Um, there is about one in three um, Europeans uh, that use um, that, that uses Instagram, uh, and and most Instagram users will know that uh, the platform has um, a problem with um, with nudity that it um, uh, promotes um, a certain vision um, of um, male and female bodies uh, that can be unhealthy. So in this uh, case it was easy to um, reach our audience because we were talking about something that uh, was relevant for many people. And I think this um, strategy uh, works for any topic as uh, most journalists will know that as soon as you uh, talk about uh, an issue that yeah, is relevant and, um, to people, whether it um, I, I think that, uh, concerns uh, automated like decision this making story or, or that uh, one on to, uh, to read uh, to to fa Facebook and Cambridge Analytica uh, were very uh, impactful in uh, reaching a broad audience. But I'm not sure that um, that they. I mean that maybe there are more relevant issues that uh, struggle to to reach a, a big audience, and sometimes the way these um, like uh, popular issues are covered by journalists by maybe non-expert journalists, journalists who usually cover other kinds of stories, uh, um, lead to a really uh, superficial understanding of what's going on. So th this is my, my, my view, my concern on this. Uh, I don't know if you, Andreas and then uh, Nicolas, agree on this. Uh, and uh, if you... Uh, if you think we as journalists could do something different to uh, something more, I don't know, to uh, bring forward these topics in a way that is uh, really uh, attractive and informative. Well, it's kind of trying to strike a balance between what people uh are occupied with what topics uh, concern them the most and what for example from our side as journalists what we regard as important and what we feel others should be taking more notice of because it's not always the most important issues um, that people are interested in maybe simply because of yeah, sim sim simple lack of interest or, or they haven't been exposed to this information or, or, or a deeper understanding of a certain issue. Um, one of the things, uh, as you were saying, like how to, how to get that message across, uh, something that we do with the European Data Journalism Network and, and Panoft as well is through data you can, you can really separate um, some of the you know emotional side and and portray information you know of of years um going going back years and and, and decades into in, in, into charts and um data and infographics ways that people can kind of get a, a clearer image a wider image of the issue at hand that this isn't you know something's happened today so we write an opinion, a reaction on this. People can get lost in the stream of information these days because it's so complicated to kind of filter through what's relevant, what's true, what's not. I feel one of the things that data um, manages to do is portray information from, from a, um, in, a, in a large time frame into a visual way where people can at least start to connect some dots, understand that um, how how the situation was a while ago and how it's evolving and so that's one of the ways I, I feel that it, it's an engaging way of um, and, a, and a way of really um, painting a painting a picture uh, and 
in order to to spike interest I, I think it's something that's kind of happening naturally as well because as we enter more and more the digital age um, whether we try to avoid it uh, we can't really tech is becoming uh, a part of everyone's lives almost by obligation and so the issues that were taking place some years ago might not have had a direct impact on someone but now we see that it's at the forefront of our lives we we really can't avoid it and and so i i think interest is, is naturally growing especially in the times we are now we've seen a lot of um technological solutions uh, you could call it solutions or or not but um technological mechanisms that uh absolutely part of our lives now and we 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 naturally become more and more interested it's hard to be, i think it's hard for for something to really hit home for someone if it's not a direct impact on on them or potentially you know further down the line so i think it's something that people are becoming more interested in and um and it comes with it comes with the age that we're yeah, I totally agree on that. And uh, Nicolas, want to add something? Um, I think you're right to um, point out to um, some of the issues uh, in the, the coverage of uh, technology by journalists in, in general. Um, and and one, one issue is um, uh, maybe a, a lack of um, a technical skill. Uh, however, there are many other issues. And uh, Andreas talked about the, the revolving door uh, earlier between uh, lobbyists and um, uh, administrators or politicians. Uh, but this revolving door also exists uh, for journalists. Uh, there are many, many journalists who uh, have been hired by uh, Google, Facebook or uh, other large uh, tech companies. Uh, and these companies also invest uh, hundreds of millions of euros into newsrooms uh, and, and uh, sponsor journalistic conferences and so on. Uh, so their lobbying also influences the coverage of tech and there are many incentives for uh, journalists and for newsrooms not to um, um, report critically on uh, tech companies. Um, and, and there is another aspect which is maybe uh, less uh, straightforward uh, about the um, technicality of tech reporting uh, I sense that um, tech reporting is being seen as a very technical beat. Uh, and of course it is in some respect, you need to have uh, a general idea of how uh, a system works in order to be able to report on it. Uh, but I wouldn't say it's the most important thing. Um, if you look at uh, a system from the eyes of um, users, of the, of the people who are impacted by it, um, chances are most of them will not uh, try to, um, will not uh, identify the different parts of the system uh, and distinguish between uh, what is technical and what is not technical. And I think journalists should uh, also have this approach of looking at systems um, in their globality uh, and not distinguish between uh, the technical and the non-technical parts. Um, and, uh, yeah, I totally yeah, agree. And should, uh, I was thinking that this kind of uh, journalistic stop, work is uh, very similar to, to the stop work of scientific on, reporting. Uh, the technical skills. I mean, when you uh, report on science, one of your you have you have to have basic skills to understand what, uh, for instance, uh, a journal article says uh, and if it's reliable and stuff. But also, you have to be able to report it in plain words to be to, to convey the the central message of that research or of that uh, topic uh, and uh, and and also 
uh, I mean, yeah, I agree that you you have to have you need to have a, a set of skills in um, yeah not to focus just on the technical ones. And uh, I was also thinking when you thought when you told about the uh, sponsorships of big tech in uh, different areas that uh, revolve around journalism. That is something that also oil companies do, like they invest on uh, newspapers, regardless of the uh, frame that those newspapers have on them. Like, uh, okay, you want, uh, uh, we are here, we are on the pages of all newspapers with our advertising. We, you're free to talk about us also in a negative way if something happens we want uh, uh we want to um, retract from our sponsorships but uh, like uh, we have this uh this uh, constant uh, presence on the pages so it, i i don't know i think it's something similar I, I don't think that facebook or google uh like tell journalists what sh- they should or shouldn't write but it's more subtle, like, uh, okay, maybe if I'm not very sure of what I would write, uh, I, I will, uh, yeah, focus on something else and uh, drop that uh, possible news uh, on, on those companies. So, yeah, another, um, another issue, since we are in the midst of a pandemic, <laughs> uh, there have been, there are many cyber attacks are happening on health structures and with uh, sometimes with uh, loss of uh, personal data of uh, people uh, so uh, very very sensitive data because we are talking about people's health and uh, i was thinking that i mean when a terrorist attack happens in a city and uh, like Thirty people die. Uh, of course, it's it's relevant and it, it has a great impact that lasts for uh, for weeks and that um, enforces uh, that that leads to to the enforcement of stricter rules for movements for travel and we somehow accept it, uh, but. When talking about, for instance, cyber attacks that can be, uh, I would say, as harmful as a terrorist attack in a way or in a different way, but I mean, uh, they can have um, great implications for security. Um, It's, uh, yeah, the impact they they reach is uh, is much lower. So... uh, I don't know if you if you have any other uh, something to say about about this uh, particular uh, type of uh, of news and and their coverage and their uh, uh, and, and strategies to to make them more uh, impactful for uh, for the public debate. No, no, the, yep. If I can jump in, is the um brought upon obviously by by covid and as we see it's really um propelled a lot of plans that have been in the works uh right to the to the forefront uh through this uh, pandemic and one of those big uh big matters that has been almost fast tracked is the merge between tech and and health and the health sector um private tech companies um, starting to really enter the enter the enter the health scene, and we saw that with the beginning of contact tracing apps uh, when they were first um, rolled out. That with Apple and Google um, being behind uh, supporting all these uh, applications, there was information at the beginning that they would be sharing. Uh, information with uh, third-party 
uh, third parties and these leaks are, uh, seem to be you know they could say it's part of the teething process this is going to be natural as we you know as we kind of shift uh, more to, uh, towards this towards this setup where all our all our health data and so on is stored um, uh, on clouds and private um, companies have access but it's something that um, yeah, we're only going to be seeing more and more. I feel because this is uh, where we're going in in, in the t in in the health sector in particular, um, and it's serious information. It's not just um, you know some post on Facebook or or some article. Uh, it's uh, it's serious, and I think it goes back to what you were saying about the the journalism as well being so influenced by by these tech companies i don't think we're seeing really the or, or being warned about the truest extent to which this could this could affect everyone it's almost being downplayed every time there's reports of you know uh, data being vulnerable um it's just because it favors so high, so highly these private tech companies who are willing uh, who are intent on on slowly dominating the health industry that you know some matters are amplified, some controversies are amplified, but when it comes to these tech companies who are now going to be uh, front runners when it comes to hosting every person's uh, sensitive data, it seems to be just brushed aside and said that it's just part of the process and it will take time and so on. I think it's um, quite concerning from, from an individual uh, perspective. Yeah, um, Nicolas, you want to add something? Uh, yeah, on, on your uh, remark of um, uh, re regarding what um, uh, editors uh, prioritize and, and what they don't prioritize, um, <laughs> th this would be a very long uh, discussion because we all know um, that these decisions um, are political in nature uh why um um why a terrorist attack um will get coverage uh but other people who die uh will not get coverage um is um sorry th this is a political decision uh and the uh, homogeneity of um, decision makers in european newsrooms is such that uh only a certain kind uh, of coverage uh, gets um, mentioned uh, and we can say the same thing of the uh, algorithms that decide what type of um, uh, content is going to uh, be shown in the news feeds um, of uh, Facebook users. Um, this being said, um, th there is um, one thing that is very specific to um, the topic of um, algorithms and uh, data in general. Uh, and, and it is its um, invisibility uh, when as a content creator um, to, to go back to the Instagram story uh, when as a content creator you cannot reach your audience you have no way of knowing if it's because you're bad uh, or if it's because uh, Facebook decided that you should not um, reach your audience um, and yeah th this not knowing uh, and this impossibility of knowing, because at the end of the day, only Facebook has the information, uh, whether they are uh, blocking you or whether um, you're not reaching your audience because uh, no one is interested in what you do. Um, this not knowing um, yeah, makes it impossible to uh, analyze the situation uh, correctly. Um, and yeah, it can, it can explain why... Um, um, invisible um, events like uh, a cyber attack uh, get less um, coverage than uh, physical destruction. Yeah, yeah, I uh, totally agree on that. And okay, to wrap up, I'll ask one last question to both, very, very general before saying goodbye and uh, it's like w what is one big issue data related that you are uh, looking at 
um, in this period or that is uh, or that you think that will be the next big thing let's say uh, on this field mm. Andreas Andrea? go ahead I was hoping to be second so I could <laughs> um, think about it some more because it's, it's such a vast uh -huh. um, issue with it's hard to separate um, uh, just one but to talk about um, something that obviously I, I, I wrote recently for panel fit mm -hmm. the matter of um, uh, digital advertising and um, targeted advertising and uh, it's such a as you just mentioned now such a kind of um, a, a silent problem is something that we all contribute to and are affected by uh, every time we we browse the web but it's um, something that somehow remains um, away from uh, away from the spotlight it happens in such obscure ways um, as we see particularly Facebook and Google who dominate the the, the side of digital of digital ads uh, even when on the outside, if you if you were to just um, make an assessment of, of the image presented uh, from even the so-called most respected uh, media sources, this isn't uh, that we're moving towards the images that we're moving towards a more secure uh, and privacy focused um, browsing experience. But in reality, um, even even the mechanisms set up to try and, and, and fend against it are, are tweaked uh, or they find ways uh, around it and that can be even more dangerous when you have the illusion that something's being improved but behind the scenes um, the, the same practices are being carried out so it's like with um, cookies uh, with uh, now the now the focus from from the big um, web browsers is that by design the, the cookies are going to be uh, phased out uh, and even even Google who have been less receptive to that sudden, uh, also claim that they will do the same but then we see that there's mechanisms in place that allow them to basically take in similar same amount of data uh, through other means less transparent to the public so you could say at least with cookies you, you have some sort of choice you're aware you can go in you can alter what you send and what you don't but when it's being presented as if these things are being phased out and now your privacy is the main focus but at the same time um the, the likes of google and facebook in particular are almost cloning uh third party cookies and presenting them as first party cookies is, is uh, it's another, uh, I think it causes another issue of many of these tech issues come down to transparency and not just transparency in the form of, you know, 1000 word reports that no one's going to read, but in a digestible way where every single user can, can at least have the very basic, um, understanding of truly what they're giving away and what they can do about it. I think what we're seeing at the moment, the very symbolic gestures that serve to just calm, calm the panic, but we don't address address the actual issue. That's why I feel we're not we're not addressing the root uh, of this issue, and um, it's something that definitely needs more exposure. Because as I said, it's something that you can't avoid. It's part of your everyday, everyone's everyday uh, online experience, and yet we still don't really know the ins and outs of it uh, and so it's something that i think it needs more attention and uh, more practical solutions rather than just you know good press releases that yeah and also and also some meps called for a total ban of behavioral advertising so we'll see if europe will step in with a, a new legislation maybe on that We'll see what happens, but yeah, I agree that some that many things are 
happening in that field. So it's, it's something to, to, to look at. And uh, what about you, Nicolas? <laughs> it's uh, impossible to say what the next big thing uh, will be. Uh, automated systems are being deployed everywhere uh, in our lives, from uh, the classroom to uh, the supermarket to uh, our phones to the streets with, um, as you said, behavioral sur surveillance. Um, so it, it's um, really hard to, to know what um, will be next. Um, what I am mostly working on, though, is uh, to try to uh, build bridges between different areas of journalism to ensure that uh, whenever these systems um, and, and wherever uh, these systems uh, are deployed, uh, expert journalists uh, have the uh, required skills to uh, understand them and to uh, keep um, a critical um, look uh, on, on the systems and not to take uh, at face value what uh, the tech companies uh, will inevitably say. Uh, uh, that's that's very that's very important. So yeah. Uh, okay. Thank you very much for being with us and for this uh, interesting discussion. Thank you. And uh, see you next time. Thanks a lot. <laughs> Thanks. Take care. Bye.